Happy birthday, Heartbleed. Are we becoming uber dependent? And China is partying like it's 1999. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 311 for Tuesday, April 7th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com, the online learning platform with over 3,000 on-demand video courses to help you strengthen your business, technology, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash tn2. That's l-y-n-d-a dot com slash tn2. Welcome, I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to today's news. Consumer groups have filed a Federal Trade Commission complaint against Google Incorporated's YouTube Kids app. Bloomberg reports that the group Campaign for a Commercial Free Childhood says the app violates safeguards for children by deceptively blending advertising and programming. Joining me to talk about this story and a few other tech headlines is Mark Millian, tech writer and editor at Bloomberg Business. Welcome, Mark. Uh, thanks, Megan. So I reviewed and recommended the YouTube for Kids app on a few of our different podcasts. I have kids. They like YouTube. They're 10 and 12 right now. So they're a little below. The, this is a little below their target audience. Um, it's really for younger kids, I think. But I understand the frustration with YouTube. I mean, I've been a cord cutter since they were toddlers. They've gotten all their TV from Netflix. So it wasn't really until they started watching YouTube that they were exposed to ads. But, I mean, we all have to make a living or do you think these complaints are about the ads or the way the ads are presented? Well, um, Google's reaction to this seemed uh, seemed like they were surprised to hear this. Um, they they said that they had worked with many of the groups that were signing this letter, complaining about the service, um, and you know it's a murky issue. I think uh, if the core complaint is that children should not be exposed to advertising that I'm, um, I'm a little less convinced of because Nickelodeon has been doing this for decades and Saturday morning cartoons had commercials. And so advertising to children isn't new. Obviously you need strict rules to, um, to be careful about what you show and not use deceptive practices. Um, but I think really the, the core of the issue here is one that applies to all of the internet. And it, that's the, you know, on the web, it's especially confusing about what's an ad and what's not. You see, you know, a lot of sponsored, um, sponsored content around the web and you see a lot of brands that claim to be, especially on YouTube, you know, creating, editorial content when it's, you know, very, very hard to discern what is editorial and what is just embedded advertising. Right. I mean, and that's just not even for kids. I mean, that's what they're talking about. But for adults, too, I mean, that was the big issue with a lot of blogs. Like suddenly, you know, blogs became popular, then they were being sponsored and you didn't know if someone was sponsored and who they were sponsored by. So it's not even really just a problem with kids. I mean, it's a problem of regulation, don't you think? Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's just an incredibly difficult thing to police. And the Federal Trade Commission, I'm not sure if they're equipped to to properly, you know, police things like the distinctions between editorial and advertising or, you know, deceptive advertising, which is another issue where, you know, even on TV, you get companies that make outrageous claims that would be difficult to back up in a court. Um, and yet rarely are these challenged. Right. I mean, I think part of the issue also is that, you know, as a, a tech savvy mom, you know, I, I know like not to sit my kid in front of the television and just let them watch commercial television all day. So, you know, you think, oh, well, I'm handing them over the, iP the iPad. Like I, you know, I'm a cord cutter. I, I've gotten away from advertising. So I think that's probably what surprised a lot of parents just to hand over the device and then suddenly think like, oh, what are they watching? Like, is that a Barbie ad or is that a Barbie video? And, you know, I think that 
that's part of what's in, what is difficult to discern here, I think. So what about the user-generated content on uh, on YouTube? And that was another issue I think they were having because it's really hard to regulate that, right? Oh, for sure. Um, and you'll find a lot, you know, many of the, the biggest YouTube independent creators are getting approached all the time by brands who want to... Uh, who want to pay them in exchange for um, product placements in their videos? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, it's it's across the board. It's a difficult thing to do. But I think uh, you know, in particular, the the consumer group was um, zeroing in on um, on these brands um, that that own these branded channels like uh, Lego and McDonald's and Barbie that you know claim to be creating these editorial shows for kids. Um, and yet, you know, somehow many of their products happen to parade throughout the episodes. Right. And, uh, we talked about this morning on, on tech news this, today that, uh, you know, on TV, it's highly regulated. If you're going to show a, my little pony, uh, cartoon, you can't show a, my little pony ad for my little pony toys, you know, during the commercial, but they, there are no rules like that. Seems logical. Yeah. <laughs> so it was interesting because I think this, the consumer group said that a free ad supported experience for kids will never be acceptable. I mean, that was what their argument is, which I think um, then YouTube, as you said, Google's response to this or YouTube's response to this was that, you know, well, well, people can, some people can't afford to pay for ad free content and they shouldn't be the only ones with, you know, people who can pay shouldn't be the only ones with access to the content. I mean, do you think that's a, a good argument? I mean, because that's what TV is supported by ads. What do you think about that argument? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what conversations, uh, what the nature of the conversations were when Google claimed to have been talking to these consumer groups before they released the product. Um, but just the, the very idea that you can't have a free service supported by ads that caters to kids, I don't really buy it because, I mean, going back to, like I said, Saturday morning cartoons, that is a free service available to children that's supported by ads. If, if you're watching through a TV antenna, then, you know, the only thing that the, uh, that the broadcaster is, is getting from the viewer is their ad attention. So I, you know, this has been going on for several decades and to, to not make the connection between that and what YouTube is trying to do um, seems a little misguided to me. Yeah. I mean, I think what it comes down to is anything that has to do with, you know, raising kids. It's like you have to explain to them what advertising is. And one thing that, um, that the Google app does, that the YouTube app does, is it doesn't have comments. And I mean, if I had to choose between letting my kids watch ads or having them have free access to, you know, the kind of offensive comments that are on the real YouTube videos, oh, then, yeah. <laughs> then I, I would choose YouTube comments are the, the worst thing on the internet. <laughs> they are. So well, let's completely switch gears and anyone who's watching who doesn't have children can continue listening now. Uh, Bloomberg had another piece today uh, with a surprising statistic that said that Uber accounted for 47% of the second largest provider of travel and expense management software in North America. I mean, that's sort of implying that 50% of businesses use Uber. Is that what the statistic this statistic means? Yeah. Um, so uh, it's it's difficult to get a clear picture of um, of business usage, but um, but my colleague Brad Stone spoke to the second biggest um, operator of, his, of expense software um, that you know some of the largest businesses in North America use to to manage uh, their corporate travel, and you know they told us that. Uber usage um, is approaching half of all ground transportation expenses through their system. So that means that professionals at, at companies throughout North America are increasingly and very, very quickly turning to Uber as almost their default um, for getting around in cities uh, while they travel. Uh, we had a, a chart that ran alongside that story that kind of visualized how quickly um, this shift has happened where, uh, you know, just um, 
just about a year ago, Uber accounted for less than 20 percent um, of expenses through the system, whereas you know taxi, limo, and bus expenses together accounted for close to 90 percent. Um, and now, you know that that latter category is down to just over half, and Uber is up to just under half. I mean, it's just a, a startling shift that happens. And and meanwhile. Um, uh, Lyft is at something like 1%. So uh, Lyft so th- is more for consumers, businesses are using that. Yeah, range. and you know, it's also got a, a smaller footprint nationally, um, I think, and, and virtually non-existent internationally. Uh, but yeah, I think you know, business customers, um, those sort of higher-end professionals uh, tend to go for an Uber ride over a over a mustache ride. <laughs> right. uh, and also, you know, Uber has has done a lot with their business development team in terms of bringing on businesses. They have a, a, a program called Uber for Business um, that they rolled out last summer, um, which makes it easier for companies to uh, have their employees expense um, their rides into Uber. They also did a deal with American Express, which is like, for any executive, like the default, you know, corporate card to have, um, and then they've worked with uh, some popular, you know, travel and uh, and and restaurant companies for business people like Starbucks and United um, to build Uber directly into their apps. So, what is this uh, quick ride? I mean, what does this mean? Uh, I, obviously, we've you know we heard a lot about Uber being uh, you know cities cracking down trying to um, stop Uber, but it seems to not be working so well. I guess they. They still seem to be doing pretty well. Yeah, I mean, what's what's really startling is that uh, it it often takes a long time for for businesses to accept um, a new type of company, whereas Uber is just a few years old and already, um, you know, just from the bottom up, um, people and companies are are adopting this on their own and billing it back to their expense accounts um, and. I can't. I can't think of another, you know, either piece of software or travel company or anything in this category that has blown up so quickly among the often slow-moving corporate world. Uh, and once companies become reliant on a service, it's very hard to switch them off of this. So obviously, the numbers are. Um, are, are pretty amazing when you consider how it's eating into traditional um, transportation services like uh, taxis, limos, and buses. But it spells very bad news for Lyft, um, which is going to have an even harder time breaking into this professional market now that Uber has has really taken over so much so quickly. Right. So, I mean, are the statistics broken down enough that we can tell that it is larger corporations? It's not just a, all the startups in the world use Uber. It's it's the big companies are using it too. Yeah, Certify um, has a pretty pretty wide footprint. Um, it's not not just a startup phenomenon. Um, you know, there are Fortune 500 companies that use Certify. So. Uh, you know they don't publish their their client list, but um, it is a it is a pretty wide swath, and so uh, it's definitely not a startup. I I would think if you were in San Francisco, you're and you work for a startup, you're much more likely to be using Lyft than you are if you work for you know GE. Right. Um, so I would think that you know their numbers would be even higher on, in another sample. Um, so this this is like a, a pretty Pretty amazing uh, statistic. It is. Well, let's move on. Speaking of spart- startups, another Bloomberg headline that caught my eye compared the current price of tech stocks in China to the dot com bubble. Um, now, do you think that China's technology stocks are overvalued right now? Uh, it's it's pretty hard to argue uh, with this data point. Um, so, so our. Uh, you know, our reporters in uh, in China looked at um, this, you know, basically base metric for um, for valuing public companies, um, price to earnings, uh, which is essentially, you know, what investors are valuing the stock at versus or compared with um, the actual profit that the company is generating. 
Um, so during the dot com, at the very height of the dot com bubble in Silicon Valley in uh, in two thousand, the price earnings ratio was one fifty six on average. Um, in China right now for tech stocks, it's two hundred and twenty. Wow, this is very bad news if you're an investor in a technology stock in China. That's not to say that the you know every Chinese tech company is a bad bet. I mean, Alibaba, Tencent, um, Xiaomi, which is not public yet, those are all look like very solid companies by many regular metrics. But there's so many of these little companies that you've never heard of, which do have a relatively large footprint within China's, you know, digital and internet economy, um, which is largely closed off from the rest of the world. Uh, but I mean, these numbers are just crazy. Like these companies are not making nearly enough profit to warrant some of their valuations on the public market. And that goes to a number of issues within uh, China's investment community. I mean, in China, it's extremely difficult to um, to put your money anywhere and and actually have a sound investment. Like you know, bank accounts, uh, savings account is going to get you like you know close to zero interest. So a lot of them are looking for for somewhere. Uh, the middle class and above are looking for somewhere to put their money where they can actually get some back. And within recent years. The place to do that is in IPOs, and so anytime some remotely hot tech company is about to go public, everybody wants to get in on the IPO because it's like a sure bet that your money is gonna uh, that you might double or triple your money. Um, but that's not sustainable, right? Um, yeah, I mean, yesterday there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal about Xiaomi, and they're throwing these big parties and. Um, it just made me think exactly of living in San Francisco in the late 90s and uh, everywhere you walk there was someone, you know, throwing a party, sock puppets everywhere, and, and that didn't last, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Xiaomi isn't even public yet. Imagine what they could do with all the uh, all that IPO money. Yeah, well, I guess we'll be following that story and hopefully everything will work out okay. <laughs> <laughs> wood. So it's been a year since the vulnerability, since the Heartbleed vulnerability was made public, and uh, you guys are reporting that many companies still haven't fixed their networks and their service servers. Um, give us a little reminder about what the Heartbleed hole is and how uh, cyber criminals could exploit it. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on how exactly it works, but as far as I know, it's a uh, you know a, a flaw in um, in many website security protocols um, where uh, once the vulnerability was became public knowledge, um, it's a super easy way to, um, you know, inject malicious code into a website and, uh, and infect um, a visitor's computer. Uh, and this was obviously a huge story when it broke a year ago. Um, and you know, it was like, and it, every website you go to was vulnerable at the time. And there was all of this alarm about, um, you know, how, you know, Facebook is vulnerable and Twitter is good. And then, you know, all of these companies rushing the, the biggest companies rushing to fix their code. Um, and so this, you know, the story was big for several weeks. Um, the cybersecurity and engineering community was freaking out. Um, and then it kind of petered off. And so now uh, we looked at this one-year anniversary as an excuse to, to take a look back. Uh, we spoke to some security experts. And, um, and one, one found that... A year later, 74% of the more than 1,600 uh, companies that uh, they analyzed are vulnerable still. Um, and these are these are huge, giant companies. Some you know some of the 2,000 largest companies in the world um, by market cap. So why why um, haven't they patched their systems? Why isn't there something they could be doing? Uh, sure, they could fix it. <laughs> Uh, but but they don't, you know. It's uh, it's it's not an 
relatively easy fix. You got to devote resources to it. And a lot of these companies aren't prioritizing it. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, how, you know, many companies don't, uh, prioritize cybersecurity. We did, a uh, a big cover story on, on target and how they were tipped off a number of times to vulnerabilities in their security systems before that massive, massive credit card hack, uh, during the holidays, uh, a couple of years ago. Um, it's, it's just, Companies do not, many companies don't take information technology and security seriously. And that's a real problem. Yeah, it's easier, I guess. They think it's easier to clean up the mess afterwards, although I don't know how it could, could possibly be easier. <laughs> it's definitely not easier to clean it up afterward, but um, it's it's like anything in life. You don't really think about risk until it actually bites you, and then you have to deal with the consequences. And that's how a lot of these companies are treating cybersecurity. Right. Well, Mark Millian, thank you so much for all of your feedback on all these stories. And uh, you're a tech writer and editor at Bloomberg. Where's the best place for people to keep up with your work? Uh, yeah, check out uh, Bloomberg Business at Bloomberg.com and our tech coverage at Bloomberg.com slash tech. Well, thanks, Mark. Talk to you soon. Thanks, Mike. Coming up, good. Madonna is still like a meerkat virgin, and soon you too can buy a $60 selfie stick. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. lynda.com is for problem solvers, for the curious, for people who want to make things happen. Maybe you want to develop an app, take better photos, improve your memory, or build a new website. lynda.com has everything you need to feed your curious mind. Do you want to learn a new programming language? Check out lynda.com. There are courses on Swift, PHP, C, C++, Python, Ruby, Java, and more. They also have an innovative monthly series called Code Clinic, where lynda.com issues a code challenge and authors share their solutions using different programming languages. With a lynda.com membership, you can stream thousands of video courses on demand, complete with transcripts, which allow you to follow along or search for an answer and skip to that point in the video. Your lynda.com membership gives you unlimited access to training on hundreds of topics, all for one flat rate. Whether you're looking to become an expert, you're passionate about a hobby, or you just want to learn something new, visit lynda.com slash TN2 and sign up for your free 10-day trial. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. And we thank lynda.com for their support. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. CNN reported this afternoon that Russian hackers breached the White House computer system, according to U.S. officials. And that was an eye-catching headline for sure, but the truth is that this is not a new incident. CNN is clarifying a story that we've been bringing to you over the past few months. What is interesting is that it seems the government cannot get these hackers out of their system that was apparently breached using the good old-fashioned spear phishing email. The cyber criminals have gained access to sensitive yet unclassified information, such as President Obama's schedule. Deputy White House National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes would not comment on CNN's assertion that the hackers were from Russia. Who remembers when Madonna premiered her Papa Don't Preach video on MTV and played it once every hour on the hour for 24 hours? This girl remembers. So guess who was waiting patiently on Meerkat at 10 a.m. Pacific for the premiere of Madonna's new Ghost Town video? Not me, because I'm an adult now. But a lot of people were there waiting. And you know who wasn't there? Madonna. Fans and you, if you were watching Tech News today on this very network this morning, were disappointed when the Ghost Town video never appeared on the live streaming app Meerkat. Instead, most people saw an error page or a coming soon page or nothing. Instead of fixing the error, Meerkat and Madonna appeared to simply give up without explanation. Then around 3 p.m. Pacific, Madonna tweeted that they would be taking another try in about 19 hours. Either way, I think you can rest assured that her video will be available somewhere tomorrow. In today's Apple Watch Watch, which is brought to you by my own excitement, Business Insider reports that Apple retail chief Angela Arentz wants to encourage a change in mindset when it comes to long lines of people waiting at Apple stores on launch day. According to an internal video leaked to Business Insider, Apple wants employees to encourage customers to buy the new Apple Watch from the online Apple store or by using the Apple store app. Customers will not be able to walk into a store and try on the watch without an appointment. 
The video confirmed the rumor that the watches will all be kept under glass and will not be available to play with like iPhones or other Apple products. Online booking and sales for the Apple Watch will begin this Friday at 12.01 Pacific time. And finally, Engadget reports that camera camera company Nikon just legitimized the selfie stick. Now, I agree if legitimizing means charging customers $59.95 or something that can be picked up for free at tech conferences. The Nikon site says that the NMP001 allows you to take selfies or self-portrait photos, in case you didn't know what a selfie was. If you're considering paying $59.95 for a selfie stick, please email me and tell me where you are right now, and I will come and take your picture for you for the low, low price of $58.95. And that is it for this edition of the Tech News Tonight. Have you taken our annual survey yet? Go to twit.tv slash survey to tell us what you think. The survey is anonymous, and we want to know all about what you think about all of our shows. So check out the survey and subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write to us at TN2 at twit.tv. You can watch live every weekday right here at 4 p.m. Pacific. And we've been asking you to post your selfies watching Tech News tonight, and we've had a great response. Today's TN2 selfie fan of the day is Dana Schwartz, who posted the following picture watching the show. This is how my cat Smudge and I watch TN2 each night. Thanks for the photo, Dana, and thanks for watching Smudge. Send us more of your selfies. Tag your pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or via email to TN2 at twit.tv. And tell us a little bit about yourself. We might just show your selfie on the show or your cat's selfie. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News, today every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.